Okay, thank you, Rudy. And so I am here to present the reissue of the F99 K00 Predoctoral to Postdoctoral tra Transition Award for a Diverse Genomics Workforce. An overview of the program is that it provides support for up to two years of the pre-doctoral F99 phase and up to three years of the postdoctoral K00 phase. And I won't read all the um, budget components, but as you can see, it does cover a stipend uh, and tuition or salary as appropriate for the career stage, as well as um, institutional allowance or research development support, and then travel to, to scientific meetings and the annual training uh, meeting. What this program does that's unique is it provides a continuity of funding and preparation for a career in independent genomics research. It provides opportunities for individuals from diverse backgrounds, including those backgrounds that are underrepresented in biomedical research. And then as we've seen from our awards so far and applicant interest, it provides opportunities for research and career development across the spectrum of NHGRI research mission areas. One of the things that we did update in 2022 was that um, in the spirit of inclusiveness, we opened the eligibility to include non-US citizens. Um, for this reissue, no major changes are anticipated. Um, we are aware of at least four other F99 K00 NOFOs across NIH, and so we're going to be considering um, aligning parts of them. Um, from a preliminary review that we've done, it's mostly around clarifying expectations around the F99 to K00 transition period, but we're not um, considering any major uh, programmatic changes at this point. Um, so that is... Oh, actually, before I get to questions, I know that um, the, our process for program announcements that are reissuing is even shorter, but uh, council members did ask to see the funded awards, and so you can see here we funded two in fiscal 22, one in fiscal 23, two so far in fiscal 24, but the fiscal year is not um, over yet, and so there may be uh, other awards we consider in this space. And as you can see from the topics, uh, they do cover um, a, quite a broad range from experimental to observational science to LC. So that is all I was going to present, and I'm happy to take any questions. And um, Dr. Brothers and Dr. Cox, I think, were the discussants. So if you want to kick off the conversation. Yeah, so I, I really support this um, award. And I, I would say one of the things that um, it looks like it does is catalyze more thoughtful discussions and activities among late stage uh, young graduate students on really what they what the optimal postdoc experience would be, and I think um, really get them to think through not just you know a cool postdoc, but really the best postdoc for what they want to do going forward. And I I've seen this now in action, um, and I so I'm very supportive of this for. For particularly for these trainees who have lots of options, um, really, and um, thinking through the right match for their next stage is a really good thing. And um, I think they're going around to give talks at places. It gives them a lot more speaking opportunity and, op and ways to get themselves known. Um, so I, I see it as a really good thing for making sure that we keep that pipeline going in a really good way. Thank you, Nancy. So just a question, you know, I completely agree with Nancy. One of the key uh, challenges that this mechanism addresses is folks going through grad school and then leaving for industry without doing a postdoc. And I just wondered, you has this program been around long enough that you have a feel for whether you're sort of like enticing people to go into postdocs or you see people bouncing out of the program before their K00 starts? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And I think we don't have a lot of data yet. We just had the first awards in fiscal 2022. And in fact, those awards are all converting this year. But you know, but they all are converting. So it's suffice to say they were probably had a high bar of um, research and, and training potential to start. So, so we're all expecting them to convert. Um, the other thing that we're starting to see that I hadn't anticipated is actually people who want to stay in genomics for their postdoc, but maybe want to move into a different area of genomics. And so, you know, having that K00 phase can help them with that flexibility and, you know, imagining what their possible career in genomics might look like if it wasn't constrained to whatever they did their dissertation uh, in their lab. Yep. 
Tim, <clears throat> Tim, go ahead. It's great to see it extending to non-U.S. citizens. Have there been a lot of applicants from non-U.S. non-U.S. citizen applicants since it's, it was done? It's it's still a fairly small program, but we have had some. Yes. Okay, great. Lucy, I was just curious to know, is there, um, what happens if they don't convert? If they, say, go straight into industry, is there a payback or anything? Um, oh, gosh. I, I might have to check with our DEO colleagues. My understanding is the payback is incurred at the postdoc phase, so I, I don't think there is, but we might need to look into that for sure. Yes, Judy. Yeah, this is a great program, Lucia. Um, for all the programs, actually, the tracking plans, kind of the alumni plans, the connecting one awardee with another, um, how are you, do you have plans for that explicitly or? Um? Yeah, so, I mean, it's an interesting question. They are all in slightly different areas of research, but one venue that we have for, for not just those trainees, but a number of trainees to connect is the annual training meeting. And so the expectation is that all of our F99K awardees will also come to the training meeting so they can be connected with uh, other uh, postdocs and um, junior investigators who attend that meeting. So one more comment. I mean, one of the things that we see as a barrier to some of these things is the, um, for people who don't have family wealth to back them up, a move is a very expensive thing. And really looking at some of the experiences with um, really good underrepresented group members that we have tried to recruit, that that's a, a barrier. <laughs> By the time, I mean, you, you don't usually have your your um, your money back from your last place that you lived before you need to put, you know, a hefty payment down for the next place you're going to live. So you incur all of these expenses at a time in your life when you, as a graduate student, having been haven't been earning very much money. So we we've it prompted me to approach some of the offices at the university where I am to develop a fund that we can use to def help people temporarily defray these costs. Because I, I asked whether there was any, you know, chance to do this, you know, some kind of a loan, and, but it can't, it can't really be part of these training programs, but it is still a, a necessary expense in the transition from the pre-doctoral to the post-doctoral. And I think it's just something we should be thinking about because this is a dumb reason for people not to be able to execute a move. It's just a, and we're not used to necessarily paying postdoctoral moving expenses, but it's a, it's a much bigger issue in these circumstances. And, and I think a general point about a lot of these institutional training grants and, and fellowships for that matter is they are very, fairly constrained, constrained in terms of what the budgets can support, but that is in, in no way saying that you know, institutions can't provide the flexibility and support their trainees for the expenses that aren't covered by the NIH awards as well. Okay, can I get a motion to approve the concept? Second. All in favor? Anyone opposed or abstaining? Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Thank you Council.